Welcome back to Paris Adapt Presents, a weekly series of video showcases where people from around the world present their work from the confines of their home. We also include a special feature performer, much like we did in the open mic. This week's feature is Mathieu Caillé, whose poetry and prose are featured in numerous publications, including the Los Angeles Times and Saturday Evening Post. A graduate from the Vermont College of Fine Arts, shout out to Vermont, he is a winner of a Short Story America Prize and a Shakespeare Award. Mathieu's short story collection, Los Angeles, has been honoured by multiple book awards. His poetry collection, May I Have This Dance, was the winner of the 2017 New England Book Festival Poetry Prize. And his children's book, The Underappreciated Life of Humphrey Hawley, has been nominated for the Caldecott Medal and the Newbery Award. His most recent poetry book is the collection Catacombs of the Heart. And because we're based in France, we have French listeners and we love all languages, and it's the only other one I can speak. Mathieu Caillé est un écrivain de prose et poésie. Sa collection de nouvelles a été honorée par de nombreux prix. Sa collection May I Have This Dance a gagné le prix de poésie du New England Book Festival 2017. Et son livre pour enfants, The Underappreciated Life of Humphrey Hawley, a été nominé pour la médaille Caldecott and the Newbery Award. Son livre le plus récent est le recueil de poésie Catacombs of the Heart. Now, briefly. Because when you sit in front of a fire, it is a requirement that you say something that sounds wise. A few days ago, my mother-in-law sent me a poem about confinement that was supposedly written by a Kathleen O'Meara in 1869 during a cholera outbreak. It wasn't. Sorry, I said. I did some research and found out that it was, instead, written by a Kitty O'Meara from Wisconsin a few days ago. And this is my takeaway from that anecdote. Firstly, life and lies continue. This is reassuring to me. Much like the dozens of spam emails I get about weight loss and nail fungus, they keep coming, ergo the world has not ended. Secondly, from this there is evolution. The extra time I took to fact check about Kathleen or Kitty O'Meara was because I was bored. But the next time I'm sent something presented as fact, I might decide to look into it and this might not be just because I am bored. By this, I mean that after the daffodils, I've noticed the sprouting of more critical thinking and not just in myself. Could coronavirus be our post-truth hangover? Don't disappear too far down that analogy, it probably won't hold up. But in any case, my hope is that after this epidemic, we emerge blinking and overweight into the light with renewed faith in science and the necessity for critical thinking and genuine introspection. And these are two qualities that, for me, make for great art.
Hello Paris Lit Up. This is Vivian Vermes in Montparnasse in lockdown on a beautiful March day. I'd rather be out and about, but well done Paris Lit Up for getting this going online. It's great. So I'd like to read you my prose poem. It's called um, The Codfish Speaks and it's indirectly about the corona crisis that we're all going through. The Codfish Speaks. It was the worst of times. We used to swim in shoals. So many of us drifting with the cold North Sea currents. Hundreds of us, thousands. It was eat and get eaten, of course. If you swam behind the shoal, if you swam too near the edge, something would get you. So if you were clever, you didn't. You swam at the heart of the shoal. And then it began, not the eat and get eaten, the rules of the game, something much, much bigger, something huge and dark and frightening. It came carving up the water with a steady, implacable sound, and then a harsh grinding as something was lowered down to where we swam, and then whoosh all around, thousands and thousands of our shoal, and the next, and the next, and not just even us, anything that swam, anything that floated. There we were, all threshing around, trapped, tails flailing. It was no good. There was no escaping this enemy. It tangled you in its mesh mouth. It swallowed everything. I was one of the very few who was small enough to wriggle through into freedom. But there were more mouths. They came daily mouth after mouth. What a massacre in the meshes of these mouths. By now I'd learned to stay, not in the heart of the shoal, but on the edge, or further off. I watched the shoals die in their thousands, until finally I was alone, the only one left. I prayed then, you think codfish can't pray? Well, I could see the moon being broken and unbroken every night by the surface of the sea, so I thought she might understand, and I prayed in my own way. Do not leave me alone. And then one day it happened. The moon had listened. They stopped coming overnight. One morning, exactly in time with the big spring tides, they stopped. No more engines, no more grinding of pulleys, no more of those huge mesh mouths. It all stopped. The sea returned to its great beautiful sounds of surge and ebb and flow and ebby. The water cleared, became blue where the sky fell in and green where the seaweed shone on rocks. And there, down in the depths, I saw them coming through the water. The first newborns, hundreds of them, our new shoals, replenishing the waters after so many years of slaughter. I thanked the moon goddess then, and I prayed for another miracle. I prayed that whatever event had happened to keep the mesh mouths and their greed away, that whatever it was would last. This is called Overexposed Image. Magic sun dust covers the surfaces of my living room. When the sun leaks through the glass window, everything glistens, yet everything becomes exposed, and sometimes overexposed. When an image is overexposed, it is cause of too much light. In this case, right now, at this time, it's not too much for me. Every morning the house shines differently. Old and new reflections appear, either from the blinds or the geometric shapes of objects present. Every day we can find new textures, new lights, new heat in the same room. When I think back at the overexposed childhood days, I see the sun and water, the warmth of a towel wrapped around me, the smell of wet and fresh grass. I breathe it in, and suddenly, my throat clears up.
Time feels so fluid. Days pass without recognition, flowing by and becoming weeks and months and years. I awake. My God, how, how long have I been gone? How much time lost? Flustered by the rude awakening to reality, I scramble about hurriedly, using motion as proof that I am alert and that I am aware of my surroundings and that they too are aware of me. So incensed, I become zealous, and in my fit, I overstep. Time feels so amorphous, a formless form moving me from then to now and on to later. Jarred by my gait's miscalculation, I stop and look about and wonder, how is it I got to where I am? Thinking back on it, I cannot quite seem to recollect all it was that I had meant never to forget. My stare lengthens, my stomach wheezes, my chest Titans. I, I am lost. Time feels as a fractal, when considered as a human sense, perceived only finitely, but understood only infinitely. Frightened by the haunting realization I cower and turn and run off, searching frantically for the things which once brought me comfort. Onwards and onwards, bolstered with fear, I go. Fear that should I stop, all might forever disappear. So shaken, I act with disregard, and in my careless abandon, I fatigue. I sit. I close my eyes. I breathe. I awake. So that's my poem for you. Uh, that's forever again. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope it was able to say something to you. Um, and I'd love to hear what what, uh, what you thought about it, your experiences about it. The poem that I will read next is called There's No Way to Say Goodbye. We promise ourselves a trip on the road like Kerouac to see everything, close our eyes, and dream with appealing waves. Cigarette dangling from his lips, he strummed the electric gypsy. Blazing-eyed, he sang of darkness, revenge, life, death. His mind scribbled notes. My eyes transfixed, he was a butterfly on a bush, a charming bastard but complex and confused. Like the sharp, strong afternoon sun, joy became pain sliding deeper and deeper into my skin. My happiness slid like recurring nightmares. The past sealed like a tomb.
Hi there. My name is Matthew Kaye. Um, I'm an author of fiction, poetry, and children's books. I'm going to be reading for a few minutes from my newest collection of poems, Catacombs of the Heart, from Luchador Press. It's a weird time, so uh, hopefully you have time to listen. Uh, the book is kind of about catacombs in the sense of a repository for all the things we humans experience. So there's some light ones, some dark ones, uh, a little bit of everything in between. All right, we'll get started here. And big thanks to Paris Lit Up for allowing me to do this. Maybe heaven's a mulligan. Here's how it might go down in my nirvana, not Cobain's, not Siddhartha's, nor any other deities. Right there on Interstate 89, I'd find you again at the Tipsy Fox, making half circles on the rotating bar stool, a sweating tequila in your grip. I'd puff the same joke as last time, the one about Bon Jovi that made your lips bend hard and your head brush back. After a few drinks, I'd slam a song on the jukebox, E7 probably, and we'd dance again, humid, eyes holding, shuffling our shoes on the puzzle piece floor. This time, though, I'd invite you back to my room, listen to your heels on the walkway, the neon buzz of the vacancy sign, and savor the bolt of the door as it found its jam. Then, there on the bed of room 18, I'd spelunkle your thighs, weld my hands to your curves, and drop my mouth to your lips, which I've always imagined taste like Friday. Six thirty-three a.m. Shaving soap, a lather, crumbs of sleep in eyes, a yawn, a dog walk, the drip of hot coffee, mascara, hair dryer, heat, shower steam, newspaper ink, bus stop lines, brown bag lunches, backpack zips, hurry, gotta go, see ya, love you, me too. Bye-bye, call you later. The thawing of day, these gradations of morning. My mother is the Statue of Liberty, for Callie. Dragging her body out of the Buick, grocery bags cradled in her arms, eyeshadow matching the half circles under her eyes, she shuffles to the front door, wedges it ajar with her foot. Her apron covered in coffee, mustard, some sloppy Joe sauce, the blue plate special on Thursdays at the diner. Setting her purse down, she shuts her eyes, grabs what she can of blackness, then asks about my day. Asks my brother the same. Asks about our spelling and math tests. Then asks dad about his truck and if he was able to find work at the Hy-Vee on I-80. With one hand, she works off her apron mutters in a whisper that she can't believe she wore at home, then funny enough puts it aside as she prepares a dinner of elbow noodles and ground beef. No one asks how her day was, and even if we did, she would smile and say, good, why don't you get washed up? You finish homework? Want to read together later? I checked out a book at the small branch. Her back hunched, she starts the burner and I already know the rest of her hour. Get supper ready, set the table, carry the dish in red oven mitts, Call for us to get to the table. Get, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses before setting the casserole down and holding out her hands to say grace. Water break. If I were to die unexpectedly, please delert, delete my Google search history. How do I know if a pineapple is ripe? How hard is it to count cards? How many stars are on the Walk of Fame? How many stars are there in the sky? How long do we live? Where do I buy seaweed for sushi? Who in the hell published Mein Kampf? Who pierced Shakespeare's ear? Why did Shakespeare have a pierced ear? How do you pronounce hors d'oeuvre? Is it bad that I haven't seen Star Wars? Is Han Solo in Star Wars or Star Trek? Does sour cream go bad? How much longer does OJ have to serve? Where's the best place to buy a pug? How long do pugs live? Ways to tell a mango is ripe. Is Billy Jean King still alive? Best place in LA for a donut. How do I get a six pack? How do I grow my own weed? Why is my dog's stomach black? Why is my tongue black? Can weed make your tongue black? Can Pepto-Bismol make your tongue black? Why is my girlfriend pissed with me? When is Mother's Day? Why is my mother pissed with me? When is Father's Day? 
Why do men have nipples? Why is my tortoise swimming upside down? What happens when you swallow gum? How do I get rid of Internet Explorer? Where does Danny DeVito live? Does whiskey have medical benefits? Can you wear cowboy boots with a suit? What do I wear to an invite that says garden casual? What are the golden girl lyrics? If her pupils dilate, does that mean she likes me? What does tergiversate mean? How do you tie a bow tie? How do you make tamales? Where do you buy good tamales? Are Geminis and Capricorns a good fit? Where is prostitution legal? How expensive is a, is a prostitute? How expensive is a Vegas prostitute? Is God real? Is God out there? Does God hear me? Does God love me? Does he hate me? How can I get him to hear me? Are you God? Are you his middleman? Can you reach out to him? Can you tell him to listen to me? Can you talk to him? And when you do, can you not mention the prostitute thing? The Oral Tradition We tell the children from the moment they're out of the womb and into the world that they should believe in themselves and Santa and the Easter Bunny, too. We tell the children that voting makes a difference, superheroes are alive, and that the Tooth Fairy will soon be by with a five spot for your molar. We tell the children to believe in manners and kindness and that yourself is good enough. We tell the children to believe in angels and happiness and hard work as well. Only to little by little wean the children of these hopes and magic dust until they awaken one morning and find out that love is divorce and Kris Kringle is Costco and that the world and its chimney flues were filled with nothing other than soot and ash. The Cadillac Lounge. A Tuesday in early March at a strip club off the train tracks in Providence where the neon is burned out so the sign just reads The Cad Lounge. It's advertised as a spot with the most beautiful women that wear nothing more than a smile and a g-string. Music thunders and men stay still in leather back seats confusing erections for affection. Sweaty bills wadded in fists shiny with grease from chicken wings and curly fries. Lust sees through bloodshot eyes and half smiles, stamped out Marlboros and camels, these bent worms of addiction. Base rips and bodies glide, a dance, a flash, a clack of high heels. Bodies lacquered with perfume and lotion and caped on makeup to camouflage black eyes. Midriffs undulate like the winter Atlantic and transactions follow, legal tender for human touch. The night passes like this with no way to see time move other than the wristwatch of the bouncer who cuts on the fluorescent tubes at 2 a.m. Allowing the dancers to tuck behind the curtain to the dressing room backstage, hot with naked light bulbs and mirrors, where they remove their makeup and personas, swapping cinnamon for Cindy, and wrap themselves in heavy winter garb, coats and boots and stocking caps, to ward off the many advances heaved by that Rhode Island chill. Someone asked me what I dreamed about last night, but I couldn't tell them this. I wrote a poem about what it was to be your left front tooth, the lace in your bra, the print of your palms, the creases of your eyes, the rivets on your jeans. I was the skin on the back of your knees, a paper cut on your pointer finger, your hemoglobin, a taste bud on your savory side, your frosty irises, a freckle in the valley of your breasts. I was even your pinky toenail, in your morning shower, covered with soap suds, swirled in hot water. Only a couple more, so if you're, if you're hanging out, nice job. Hell. I'm not so sure that hell exists, but I do know that it must be like a day's in in Tampa, a Sunday at Costco, Black Friday at Best Buy, the comment section on YouTube, a nine hour layover in Atlanta, New York subways in August, subways in August, August, quiet of a widow's home, a children's hospital, dusty attic toys, driving away from the vets with just a leash, an EBT card being declined, a little girl in high heels for the first time, a kid's balloon slipping from his grip, election ads, an abandoned tire swing, 
the Santa talk, the erosion of a glacier, weak old roadkill, the permanence of the past, the brightness of a hospital room, people who don't know their worth, hashtags, Christmas trees on the 26th, the 11 o'clock news, training bras, the last page of a perfect book, airport goodbyes, the trash can after Thanksgiving, the flash of an AR-16, crop dusters chemicals, migrants who want nothing more than safety, an Ethiopian boy's sharp, exposed ribs. Last poem. Emojis are ruining the world. I worry that the more we use happy faces, eggplants, balloons, and thumbs up, the more we revert back to hieroglyphics, the more we pass on articulating sentiment, press pictures instead of swirling in their meaning. The more emojis pepper our prose, the more we use different colored hearts, the more our real ones, all four chambers of them, begin to atrophy. Thanks for listening. Um, thanks again to everyone who set this up. Weird times call for weird measures, I suppose. So uh, thanks for supporting poetry, writing, art, all of it. of bloodshed over the top sails, brash waves on deck and me waist down. She can no longer bear the effects of our costume. Confusion and lonely death for vessel-born wood worship. She who espoused that place between the sacred pair of wife and mother thinks not of hammering us to water in hell. Screams of Europa span her attention to adjacent ships ripped and foundering about the rocks. Sailors spill, shouting, swimming foamy waters, roast. Captain slogs his fist at the wheel. Broad shoulders tremble. From behind, Anubis swings a beam against him. That crown propped with a stump butt piling slips from its joint with a whimper. Raffish subordinates crowd the fore. Half decks lower to the water. Captain limp, hands clasp the helm in death walk. Rain, wash, and sludge fall through the cabins. The splendent class slings rope and ladders for themselves down into the night. Some crew, water bloated, dive for silver in the war bows and break free or perish. Should chance print the land. With airless lungs and shrinking chest, ribs, Cracked against the bilge. Master displays of fruit, gourd, and meat, provisions of all kinds, the splendid leaders, all reaped in high stakes of sun, rise through the table to bob, bond, and roiter. Covetous fingers reaching, blind in the foam. I Hush, slumped, and drawn into a pit of flotsam. A sailor's life is a jail forever if between his ears. I call the wrath of slimy gods of the deep to drown me in their hidden water. Random cannon fire belts the names into a raging, jowled sky. Mike Tyson says, you have to sacrifice happiness to be successful. Now those days are gone and it's just empty. Mike Tyson. One, I am awakened from a deep sleep. 
And I realized how much since the days, years have passed since this lockdown, New York City, since this private journey, Harlem, since the lines on my face and the little gray hairs and the tiny black chin whiskers that I miss midnight matinees the most. Like the ones I saw when I was younger. I miss them now. And the way I miss them then. The little things in the desert. Two. I miss a cool dark place to hide from the sun. With artificial lighting and a story to tell. Of viruses, of wars, of humanity on the brink, of robots with human souls. Those black and whites that thrilled me into thinking that we had a future together. But when I saw the pics of Commodore Park and Williamsburg and the new gentrified Brooklyn of the white people laughing and smiling and enjoying the sunlight, breaking quarantine. I felt the way I did as a black kid watching the Jetsons. Once again, I was looking on the bright side, another moment in the future with us written out of it. It was a dream of mist that kept us walking through the night and into the next day where my courage failed. Carry on, my lover said. Carry on, my lover the said. Land where we go is green the and peaceable. We go is peaceable green and, and peaceable. Peaceable and green. I thought of the room in which we had slept. I thought of the room in which we had slept in. The heat the walls passed through them, thin, the heat the nice passed through them, and into, and into the night. I thought of the three of us. I thought of the three, I thought of the three tiny of flecks on the turning three world. Tiny flecks on the turning world. And walked. And walked. Forty or fifty years. Forty, Forty or fifty years. years. 
What of it? What of it? The snow. The snow. The snow outside is so beautiful. I wish I could write a poem describing it so well that it would be there later if I needed it. The snow is bunched in ample tufts, held in the fingers of the branches. The snow shoots in streaks past the window screen. The snow dawdles to the yard in clumps. We are being put under again. There is no one in the room with me. The bed is white, and so is the wall. I try to keep them that way, but it is hard. Oh, it is hard. The snow enacts its great migration. The entire white country of the sky lands softly on the brown and gray earth like a blanket on a bed being made. The little white envelope of your text appears on my screen. I've yet to open it. I've received a package my mom has sent me another harmonica for my birthday. I am being gently held hostage by the snow. I haven't left the white desk beneath my white loft bed for a week. The snow looks harrowed as it falls. The snow is heaven, dismantled and shipped. We were supposed to Skype later, but I don't really want to. I have talked to no one all day. I like it that way. Off in the distance, the city has been partially erased by snow. I am trying to learn to be a simpler person to say simple things in simple ways, to not invent complexity in the attempt to explain things that cannot be explained. Warned of others who were buried under the effort to figure it all out, I'm doing my best to simplify, to let my mind be silent like the mouths of the creatures closed by the snow. Soon the leaves will arrive like letters from the open envelope of the snow. And again, the world will resume its tirade. The next poem that I will be reading is a tribute to my father, the scent of my father. Death is a cruel taunt. I used to hear the knock beside him as he slept. Remember how he used to chase me to the water's edge, frolic in the waves. I got silly butterflies when he caught me, lifting me high and clear. Always a special necktie to try with his favorite shirt, dabbing cologne on his skin and clothes. He stood in front of the mirror. Do I look okay? When I stood eye level, he was gray and bald, hearing not as sharp as it once was, but he heard me speak to the doctor. I dream of your mother last night. He fell silent for a long moment. 
and gazed at the rain-threatened twilight. We spoke no other word. There's a world beyond the curtains, a city, so they say. Is it a myth? I've caught peaks of metal and rubber driving by through the cracks in the curtain drapes and half-slung blinds, those lines of light where the promises of all creation seep and in their majesty bring us love, loss and grief. The promises arrive on the backs of people who walk past with faces etched into their skin and with histories broken into their gates as if each one had once been a horse taken from pasture in Elysian fields now saddled with tin food and pathos and paper car four bags. I've been here alone for a while. Life has been set into a motionless motion of echo and consistence. We fill our hours listening like servants for the cries of King Canute, listening that a sign might fall across the heavens and announce along with the waning of the tides that life can once again return to normal. To hear that all the people are well, the stocks are on track, the world has gotten past its sufferance. The signs come silently and behind far-off closed doors. Not in the middle of the day when the sky is blue and the sun is at its most optimistic. Nor do they come in the night to hold you when you sleep alone and feel your body's sweat flat against your skin. We have our prophets and our priests. They interpret the signs for us, warning us to wash our hands clean and hope. They do not tell us to pray. We nevertheless find their words fall into our prayers as easily as supplicants. Flattening the curve, O Lord. If ever thou art so mighty as to act in the wilds of human affairs, slow the infection rate, and God as far as I can tell, goes back to fixing the breach in the hull with sour apple chewing gum and papier mache, and further below the waves creation sinks. There is a world behind my curtains. A city, so they say. Is it a myth? A city full and silent, everyone with ears to the whispers on the wind so that we might be able to pan out a little more gold from the staunchest, thickest air. A city of so many others who are also scared. A city that, if it exists, will do as the greatest myths do. Survive from the backs of each other. I think I believe it. I want to. And that's all I have left for now to choose. It's with a crackling, voiceless breath I check again for where my inhaler is. The fourth time today, there is a world, a city beyond my window, so they say, and I choose the predilections of hope, that underneath the weight of the building lies a myth of a world finding peace with itself, before its lungs fill with panic and we begin to wreck. My brother is getting married in the midst of a plague. His bachelor party with its cowboy hats and surgical masks, its whiskey sanitizing a row of esophagi. And I haven't been touched by another human being in weeks, and it's insane to think about loving in a time like this. My own partner on another continent triggering a yawn in me through a metal square in my palm that I periodically wipe down with Lysol, that I can only open with the touch of a finger, the recognition of my face. And we once laughed that I got her sick over the phone, and now we don't talk much anymore. Borders and minds closed and opened again, to usher in an odd sort of purgatory. The distance between us, half a world plus the CDC recommended six feet. The distance between us, 
two people on opposite sides of a bus bench. And in Thailand, hundreds of monkeys are fighting over single bananas, starved from lack of attention, from visiting tourists' lunch pails. In Los Angeles, I rush and screech towards my phone at your call, fighting away rumpled sheets and empty bottles of Purell. Your voice, your name, sung from your balcony to mine, your touch, all touch, elusive and strange. We FaceTime two friends in a dark room, plead with them to kiss our glass faces together again. Two meters, 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 two meters. Two meters, two meters, two meters, two meters, meters, two 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 meters. Du musst liefern. Ich hab nichts mehr. Das ist, das ist ernst. Call me, man. This is unprecedented. I could charge double. You know, I could. If I was allowed out, and if, the, if, and if the streets weren't crawling with cops, if I had... Ich hab nichts, ja? Ich hab nicht mal was für mich selbst. Und wir können mit dem verdammten Virus auch nicht rausgehen. Desperate like. And I told her. I told them all. It's over. Ma, did you join Skype? Yeah, I sent you the instructions by post, on paper, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I promised, didn't I? Well, read them, because I want to see you, mommy Chan. <laughs> yeah, but you're staying home, yeah? No more shopping now, no trips to the beauty salon. <laughs> yeah, that's where the bad germs breed the fastest. <laughs> like, I'm serious, you need to stay home, mom. No, I'm, I'm not nagging, I'm concerned. Ma, Ma, are you coughing? Ma? Ma, are you in the hospital? Ma? Hello? Hello? Ma? <sighs> Ma, can you hear me? I love you. Ma? Oh. oh, piece of crap. I'm fucking dead. Dead. Oh, fucking fuck pay as you fucking go. Roger Waters, help me in my hour of need. No more supplies, no phone credit, and stuck in Düsseldorf. Well, Harry, that's what they call you in the clubs, isn't it? Interesting choice. When this is all over, you could get a proper job. You won't be shackled to the cash economy. You could pay online, maybe even stick to the one phone, because COVID-19 loves your stinky euro notes. Porous germ palaces, before you roll them and stick them up your nose. <laughs> yeah, Roger, because rock stars never do that. And you sent 5,000 to your mother. Yeah! <clears throat> I didn't fucking know. I, t I told her to get something nice, you know, to cheer herself up. 
Oh, Roger. It was a bunch of white billionaire's kids that started me on all this, you know? At school. I... I only partook for politeness at first. Then they sent me to their dealers. They thought I'd get it cheaper being brown. I got conned, and they blamed me, so I had to get good at it. Oh, Harry, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> See these? People have no fucking cushions now, and no way to trade them because of the cops and the curfews. So they, we, all of us, teeter on a tightrope with no end in sight. Everyone's freaking out and they've got no cushions. I doubt my dealer even has any. And like, I am, I am supposed to magic fucking cushions out of nowhere in a lockdown? Like I don't have a sick mother on the other side of the planet. But, but I do have <laughs> emergency cushions. Oh, Prime. I could, I could charge Prime for these. Triple, quadruple my margins. And because nobody goes cold turkey by choice. <laughs> Don't cry. Because it, because it's over. Smile. Because it happened. Could be the last, the real last time. Will it be as good as the last last time? <laughs> when I didn't know that it was the last time. And, and if I'd known then that it was the last time, would have loved it more. We hope you've enjoyed all the performances this evening and a special thank you to Mathieu Cahiers who personally I hope will arrange to have his next children's book released before my own child arrives. Uh, you have until July the 31st Mathieu. Thank you also to Ed Bell for his video editing skills, to Julian the cameraman and to Maury the Beagle for all of her support. For more information about how you can submit to this weekly video series, please look at the description below. <laughs>